uh, checker nodes are essentially just licenses that we sold mm -hmm. that people can purchase in order to download a software, run on the computer. Uh, they literally just click run or you can delegate to a node operator to service for them. And then that's it. You earn tokens just for running this. As long as you have a pretty good and stable internet connection, you're golden. But they're enterprise grade GPUs, usually system on chips because well, to, to render a game, it's not just a GPU. You need storage, you need memory, you need caching, etc. And so it's actually an entire, almost like mini server or what we call SOC, system on chip, rather than just a GPU, because a GPU is not enough. You like we talked a lot about the pros. Let's talk about the cons a little bit. Yeah, that's um, honestly, that's that's what kind of keeps us up at night. And that's why our our platform generally tends to be more demand driven. Um, what I mean by this is... Welcome to the gem. We're taking the more risky aspects of crypto angel assets and try to find the next 10 to 100x gem. So really what it comes down to is Houston, we have a problem. And that problem is actually eloquently stated by Sam Altman, who is the co-founder of OpenAI and ChatGPT. Just take a listen to this. I think compute is going to be the currency of the future. I think it will be maybe the most precious commodity in the world. And I think we should be investing heavily to make a lot more compute. Uh, compute is, it's an unusual, I think it's going to be an unusual market. Um, you know, people think about the market for like chips for mobile phones or something like that. And you can say that, okay, there's 8 billion people in the world, maybe 7 billion of them have phones, maybe they are 6 billion, let's say. They upgrade every two years. So the market per year is 3 billion system on chip for smartphones. And if you make 30 billion, you will not sell 10 times as many phones because most people have one phone. But compute is different. Like intelligence is going to be more like energy or something like that, where the only thing that I think makes sense to talk about is at price X, the world will use this much compute, and at price Y, the world will use this much compute. Um, because if it's really cheap, I'll have it like reading my email all day, like giving me suggestions about what I maybe should think about or work on, and trying to cure cancer. And if it's really expensive, maybe I'll only use it or will only use it to try to cure cancer. So I think the world is going to want a tremendous amount of compute. And there's a lot of parts of that that are hard. Uh, energy is the hardest part. Building data centers is also hard. The supply chain is hard. And then, of course, fabricating enough chips is hard. This seems to me where things are going. Like, we're going to want an amount of compute that's just hard to reason about right now. So, right. So, how big is this problem? How big is this issue of compute? Well, there was a post from Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z, and they talk about the supply of compute is so constrained, demand outstrips it by a factor of 10. Access to compute resources at the lowest total cost has become the determining factor for the success of AI companies. Obviously, the less that you're gonna pay, the, pro the better off you'll be. In fact, we've seen many companies spend more than 80% of their total capital raised on compute resources. And what does it really all come down to is that the different parts for AI, for fabrication, design, data centers, it comes down to a value of $1.4 trillion. So the less that these companies can spend to really get up their AI projects, the better off they'll be. So right now, we can see right here that there's actually three choke points that we talked about. Chip design, chip fabrication, data centers. Now, the chip design and fabrication, NVIDIA, Intel, Broadcam, they pretty much got that locked down. Samsung, Intel, but the data centers, Google, AWS, Oracle, Lambda Labs, that's what we're getting to at the heart of with Aether. And Aether is a distributed GPU, graphics processing unit, cloud infrastructure for gaming and AI. So today what we're gonna take a look at is the project itself. And we're gonna break it down into four different distinct levels. We're gonna talk about, will it make the cut, which is the community, utility, team, and tokenomics. And of course, we'll start with the utility to talk about what this actually does. So before we talk about GPUs and different containers and things like that, we have to understand that this is a deep in AI play, which is a fantastic narrative in the, in the crypto space right now. And DPIN stands for a decentralized physical infrastructure network, which there are a plethora of different projects that are out there. So let me ask you a question. We actually talked about this in our, in our last video. What would be more reasonable to you if you were a data center like Google, AWS, and Oracle? Would it be best for you to buy the land, put up everything, pay the fees, pay the electricity, pay the taxes, pay the people, put in the massive amount of GPUs and then have everything run? Or would you rather just do this? How about if we use 
the computational power that are in people's computers or GPUs that are out there that have been underutilized, which Aether, of course, Akash, HyperCycle, Theta and Render can do stuff like that, or even file storage like Filecoin and Arweave. Which one makes more sense to you as far as a cost perspective? I think we know the answer to that one, and that's where Aether comes in. So to break this down, they're taking a look at three criteria, three things they're trying to do it's all, as far as AI or artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cloud gaming. The network, what it's going to do is aggregate and intelligently redistributes new and idle GPUs from enterprise data centers and cryptocurrency mining operations and consumers. So we can see right here, we have maybe some laggards. Some of these GPUs aren't doing as well as they're supposed to be doing. The average US data center GPU utilization is only between 10 and 15%. So if you have these GPUs and you, and you played a, a pretty high dollar for them, and you're not really getting out what they're supposed to actually hit for their uh, amount that they can actually produce, then you are in a deficit. So why wouldn't you sign up with Aether and to actually use that and to increase the productivity of these different GPUs that are being underutilized right now? And this they talk about has the, the capacity to 10x the current global GPU compute availability. And here's how they're gonna do it. So there's three key roles to understand here. First are the containers. And containers that they talk about here in their executive summary is the powerhouse of the network. Just, just to make it super simple, containers are the GPUs. That's what they are. So how scarce is this resource actually? Well, take a listen to Elon Musk as he talks about how difficult it is right now to get top-notch GPUs. To train a model of, of probably GPT-5 size, I wouldn't be surprised if they use at least 30,000, 30, maybe 50,000 H100s, which are the latest mm -hmm. uh, GPUs. It's not quite the right word, but the latest technology from NVIDIA. Um, so, and then you need to run inference as well. Um, so, it's a lot of, the, the, the GPUs are, um, at this point, considerably harder to get than drugs. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's, that's really not a high bar in San Francisco. So right, pretty difficult. And the good thing about Aether is that they've got a number of GPUs that they can distribute and use for, uh, for the deficits that are out there. Now, what I like about this project and projects coming up is that it's not a winner take all. There is so much demand that is going to be used for compute. You will have multiple entrants in this sector and it still won't be enough. So right now we have Aether and the number of GPUs they have is 40,562. Akash, 150. Render, 4367. IONET, 19,831. And again, these are doing different things. So for like Aether, it's enterprise grade. Akash is consumer grade, same as Render. And IONET is consumer and enterprise grade. Now, if we take a look here, it says TFLOPs, FP32. And TFLOPs or teraflops is the floating point operations per second is a measure of computer performance in computing. So TFLOPs or Aether, 169,000. That's pretty good. Akash, almost 3,800. Render, 85,000. Wow. And then IONET is 483,000. Now, if we took a look at the number of A100s, H100s, which are the premier GPUs coming out of NVIDIA, out of that 40,000 that Aether has contributed, it's actually 4,000 that they have for the top knots ones. So there's a discrepancy between the 4,000 and 40,000. And we're actually gonna to talk to one of the co-founders in a bit to describe why there is a discrepancy between the number of A100s and what the actual GPUs need. Now Akash has 93, uh, Ionet has 460. And here's the big thing, just like we talked about in the very first beginning, Andreessen Horowitz, 80% of total capital raised was on compute resources. So it would probably behoove you if you were an AI startup to get the cheapest or most inexpensive option for what you're available to try. And with Aether, it's 33 cents per hour. And that's for the A100s. Akash, $1.10, Jensen, 40 cents, and Ionet, 76, 89 cents. So again, there are multiple entrants in this and there's room for everybody because compute is going to be enormous. So now that we figured out, okay, this is what containers are, they're the GPUs, what about the other two key roles, because there's three here, and those would be indexers and checkers. Indexers, which is number three, is the matchmakers. They pretty much go along and said they connect to the best available container or GPU, ensuring a fast and great experience. 
checkers are the node operators and the quality inspectors. They check on the containers to make sure they're actually working and functioning, actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, for the checkers, there is actually a node sale currently happening right now, and it has been massive so far. In the first 24 hours, they raised $92 million. In the first 48 hours, they had 26,000 ETH, which were sold for all the Ether node sales, and they've had other people come in. And you can get in this right now if you want to. This personally is not my play. I'll explain that in a second why, but it's all on a tier aspect. So right now, as of today, we're coming up on towards the end of March. If you're looking for, because it started with tier one, now we're at tier 30, I think the last is tier 54, you're going to be paying roughly 1.1753 of wrapped Ethereum, which at this point, Ethereum is roughly around $3,800. So you're looking at uh, four or $4,200, somewhere around there for a node, which is not too bad, I might add. But you might have a question is like, if you wanna get into this, well, what's the requirements? Super simple, you need a computer, and that's pretty much it. 64 megabytes of RAM, 2.1 gigahertz, 10 gigabytes of disk space, and you have to have a relatively fast internet connection. And you just have to have the thing on. You just have to download it. It's like four or five clicks. It uploads a, or downloads a software. You run the node software and you are a node operator for Aether. You don't want to go through that, which is for some people they don't want to. You can actually click on this link, which there'll be a link in the description. You can check this out. You can do NAAS or node as a service provider. And those are pretty much the requirements on top of the last one, which is the biggest one, which is don't be a U.S. citizen. So Gary wants to protect you harder. If you're a U.S. citizen, sorry, you're banned from that. And if you think, well, I'll just get around it, uh, you can try it, but they're going to KYC or know your customer. So if you're outside the United States, congratulations, you can be a node operator. If not, sorry, Charlie, you can't be a node operator. That's just how it goes. But again, for the nodes, that's not the play, and I'll get to the token in a second. However, there's another option. It's called Palau ID, and this is a digital residency program. I will put a link in the description. You can do a uh, research and uh, discover what that actually is, but uh, this, again, is not citizenship. This is a digital residency program or a digital ID. And again, links in the description, you can check that out. They do accept these as a node operator. But again, for me, the node, from what I understand, from what I see, and from what I talk with uh, Dan Wang, who is the co-founder of Aether, Node is pretty much a, a long-term play, and that's great. And there's a lot of long-term reliability here in this project. But for now, I think the token is the play for me and, and maybe perhaps for you. So let's break into it and talk about what the token actually does. So there's, there's really four things. Governance, staking, medium of exchange, liquidity. So governance, token holders can vote. Staking, of course, that's how we usually do things here in crypto. You can stake it and then earn a certain amount of yield. It's also used as a medium of exchange. Developers pay the token, which is called ATH, which is a great name, by the way. ATH token for service fees to get computing power from containers, from the GPUs. It's also for liquidity and collateral. Tokens can be used as native liquidity and collateral in the Aether ecosystem. So uh, before you ask, I'll just answer the question. It is an ERC-20 token. It is built on Ethereum, but don't worry, it's on Arbitrum network, so it doesn't have those crazy high fees. And the token generation event, or TGE, will be sometime in Q2 2024. So you're looking at somewhere around May, June, July, that would be Q2 of 2024, because right now we are in March. And you might ask yourself, but I thought that uh, ERC-20 tokens were uh, quite expensive for the transactional costs. No. Since the Dankun upgrade, and I've validated this myself with using Arbitrum, you are looking at less than a penny per transaction. Now, if this was layer one solution just on Ethereum, it would be quite expensive still, but that is not the case. They are using Arbitrum. It is built in Arbitrum. It's fast and inexpensive, and I like where things are going with this project. So we've talked about the utility. Let's talk about the community real quick. So the community, if we take a look at the socials, very simple here, we've got the X account and we have the Discord. X account is 314,000 followers, which is amazing. They've been around only for you know less than two years. And then for the Discord, they have 50,000. So you're looking at uh, almost 400,000 members uh, between two social media platforms. But this is what's important. And I, I try to explain this to people as we go on with these different projects. Crypto is great. And I've seen good projects do absolutely nothing because they didn't have the marketing, 
They didn't have the hype. They didn't have the speculation. And let's just call a spade a spade. They didn't have the greed. And I've seen horrible projects do fantastic because of high speculation and greed. So when I'm taking a look at these projects, the first thing I'm asking is who's involved with this? Who is doing the marketing? And who has the biggest bullhorn to actually get this message out? So when I go to X and I follow everybody and a lot of people follow me. So I kind of been in this, I know where people have been. I know the people to, uh, that will have that megaphone. And when I click on followers, you know, for Aether on their X account, here's who I'm looking at. I'm looking at people that have millions of followers. My man, Virtual Bacon, Sarah Money Crypto, Icy, Slayer, Games GG, and Alo. Right there, that's a million people right there between all their socials. Josh over at Cornucopias, Lady Crypto, my man, Jesus, Sam, Meg, and Mario, who Mario Knopfel has just 1.2 million himself. So you're looking at two to three million in that list alone. Pirates, Pirate Mates Murdoch, he's big in Arbitrum. My man, Jerry, Spike, Ilio, Kruger, Sandeep from Polygon, Collar Kenny, Kagi, Swissborg, I've been taking Johnny. Between all these people right here, this is five to 10 million people. This is five to 10 million between all the different socials and the bullhorn that they can be. So for me, I'm thinking to myself, if these people are following, that means they're probably involved or want to get involved. And that's a lot of hype. And that's where we're going. So to move on to our last section before we get the team is tokenomics. This will be very quick. They did a great job. They did a great job on tokenomics. And the things you want to pay attention to is TGE. How much is going to be unlocked? First, take a look at the max supply. That's 42 billion. For the token generation event, when they actually generate the actual tokens, this is how much is released. And it's only three sectors that get it. The, KO, the KOL round, which is what I'm in, and only 1% of that supply is going to be released. And it's only 10% of 1% at token, that token generation event, which could be in May, could be in June, somewhere around there. The liquidity of the market makers and exchanges, that'll be like pretty much for the public. It's only 4% but 100% gets released, but it's only 4% of the total tokens that are out there. And then of course the Dow treasury is 12.5%, 100% gets released. Of course, that is for the ecosystem. That is what they actually vote on. You gotta keep the lights on. So I get that, but 100% of TGE. But here's the thing, I've never seen this before, honestly, that, that the vesting is this locked up for this long. And a lot of people will complain. They'll say, ah, oh, this is, you know, there's a certain coin, which has been called a VC coin forever. And people say, well, it got unlocked. Everybody got dumped on. Okay. This is not happening here because what we have here, team and advisors, this is how much they bought up. 15% private sales, 15% incubator, two and a half and mining rewards, 50%. What you will notice here is that for the vesting, there is no unlocks at TGE. They get nothing they get 0%, absolutely zero. This 18 month cliff means they don't get anything to happen for a year and a half. The first time that these guys actually get, and gals, actually get their tokens is on month 19. And it goes for three years past that. Private sale is 12 month cliff and then 24 months. Incubator, 18 month cliff and then and three years linear vesting. And mining rewards, well, the best thing does go to core in the rewarding schedule for containers and checkers, and we'll see why in a second. But if you're thinking about that, about all the people in this last piece right here, where they're just waiting for it and have nothing as far as a TGE, that's a lot of people that have been backing this project. And these are big, big, big people. This is ASCII Group, Merit Circle Framework, Animoca Brands, probably one of the most recognized in the Web3 space, UB Capital, Gate.io, Bybit, Builder Capital, and Test Ventures. All these people have invested into it and they are fine with waiting a year to a year and a half to get anything and then waiting two to three years to hold that token. And to me, I've never seen that. And that's amazing. So we'll see how it all works out. But the last thing I will say is the people will say, what about the 50% minor rewards? But this makes sense because you have the nodes, you have the containers, right? Which are the GPUs, those operators and the, the GPUs that they've actually brought in. And then of course, for the checker nodes, you got to pay these guys because that's the backbone of your home of your whole business. The backing node operators, it supplies a necessary computing power, which are the GPUs. The incentive fund is designed to draw resource providers in and keep them committed. And then, of course, you uphold the container standards, containers, GPUs, to provide computing resources by incentivizing them properly. Aether attracts the most efficient resource providers. If you want the best, you got to pay the best, and that's essentially what they're trying to do here. So now that we talked about the tokenomics, let's break into the team. 
pretty good. So this is the core four, but they've got uh, over 20 different uh, employees. Right here, we've got uh, Mark Ryden, co-founder and CEO. He held key roles at Nota Platform, which is another big AI platform. Daniel Wang, which uh, he has roles of uh, at YGG, Riot Games. And if you've never heard of this little small game called League of Legends and have ever taken a look at esports, you'll know exactly how big that actually is. Kyle Okamoto, CTO, serves as CTO and general manager at Ericsson's IoT, automotive and security business, Edge Gravity, and chief network officer of Verizon Media. Then we've got Paul Thind, the chief resource officer, or chief revenue officer, I should say. He was previously the co-founder and serves as CEO of TriggerSpot, which is data analytics or analytics for business development. And they work with NFL, 20th Century Fox, and Grand Theft Auto. So what I did was I, I sat down with Dan Wang, asked him some questions. And one of the big questions I asked him was, what's the downfall of Aether and how do we know this is actually going to last? So just take a listen. This is about 10 minutes. Break mm -hmm. it down. What is Aether? Yeah, look, uh, at, at our core, Aether is a distributed hardware network of GPU compute. Uh, we help uh, underutilize GPU compute. Uh, match with demand to increase overall utilization rates uh, for the GPU and hardware compute industry. Uh, so gotcha. very simple. That's what we do. <laughs> See, I, I can appreciate that. Thank you for making it simple and not going into an embellishment of a 10 or 20 minute rant. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Dan. So let's let's let, let's really go into it real quick. There was this piece and this is uh, we covered this a little bit, but I wanted to come come back to this point. And in the executive summary, it talked about the Aether's main token utility. And the third section it talks about here is, is a, a medium of exchange where it states developers pay with the token, which is ATH, for service fees to get computing power from containers. And in other projects, they've set up, they've talked about that, but then they've came out and said, oh, you can also use US dollars, you can also use USDC, you can also use tomato coin or whatever craziness is out there. So well, is this the only thing that they'll be able to use, which will be the Aether token for these services? Uh, yes, but because uh, actually most of our current enterprise clients are kind of gun shy about uh, you know tokens or purchasing tokens, having tokens on their treasury. Um, we actually have a service entity, uh, part of Aether, that can take in these fiat contracts and converts the fiat 100% into ATH token via buy pressure right on chain. So it's 100% fiat buy pressure from any fiat contract that comes in. Uh, so it's completely using ATH token. Uh, there's no stable coins involved. Um, you just purchase ATH, and then uh, based on the service fee, uh, you know we pay out 80% of the service fee to the compute providers in the ecosystem, and then Aether as a network, uh, the protocol keeps 20%, and that goes back into the treasury to replenish rewards for containers and checkers uh, in the future. Ah, perfect. Okay, so it makes sense. So yes, of course, everybody's excited about this, but there's a little bit of a of a fiat on ramp that we have to do just to appease some of the people, which I can understand, especially for legal compliance and stuff like that. But you did actually lead us into the next question, which you're talking about the containers and the different aspects of the node operators. So first of all, it looks like everything is going pretty well for this uh, node sale. And for nodes, it looks like there's there's three key roles. Containers, as I explained in the deep dive, is like the powerhouse of the network. The checkers are like the quality inspectors, and the indexers are like the matchmakers. And you're for the actual node sales. It looks like this is for the for the checker nodes, and you guys crushed it. I mean, this was just pinned today. Twenty six thousand ETH were sold. You have ninety two million dollars plus for everything that's that, and that was a 23,000 ETH, and I don't know what ETH is gonna be uh, in, in the future. But then there's another thing that I've taken a look at. It looks like that 10 million in, uh, in nodes were sold, and this is from an ecosystem, uh, from an entity that purchased uh, tiers 24 through 27, which is UB Capital. So real mm -hmm. quick, talk us through like, you know, uh, how this has gone. Did you meet expectations, exceed expectations? And then also for the other pieces, which were the uh, containers, and also for uh, the indexers, is that another aspect of node operation? Yeah, great, great questions. Uh, I'll try and start from uh, expectations. It blew our expectations out of the water. Um, you know, we had 
obviously we had a pretty good previous round, um, some really great, um, very supportive VCs like Animoca, Hashkey, Sanctor, Merit Circle, Framework, et cetera, um, Big Brain. Uh, but then, you know, when it came to the checker node sale, because it involved operating and contributing to the ecosystem, the barriers are a little bit higher than just cutting a check. You got to work. Um, so we went out and forged, I think, 11 or 12 different launchpad partnerships, 70 plus NFT communities, DAOs, syndicates, um, from your C to to your D whales, to your ARCs, to your... Uh, Gojira or the, uh, you know, uh, a Punk's DAO, uh, wow. Cyber Kongs, Neo Tokyo, you, you name it. Um, so we knew on the whitelist side, we had secured a lot of support. What we were really surprised by was how many average retail users were willing to overcome this kind of barrier of entry of how do you run a node? What exactly is a node? To mm-hmm. then still participate invest a decent amount of capital into the rights to operate a node in our network. Um, and so this kind of comes back to the, the uh, three roles. The checkers, like you said, are kind of the inspectors in the ecosystem. Um, they are checking on the quality of experience, uh, the overall quality of service, the uptime, liveliness, and capacity of mm-hmm. containers. Now, the containers are just that's a fancy word for the GPUs, right? So like you have an H100 or a 3090, 4090, some system on chip, like that GPU we call a container. And in that virtualized container is running some sort of LLM task, AI inferencing task, or like a real time video game cloud rendering right. experience. Now in a decentralized ecosystem, we don't own the hardware, so we can't actually tell ourselves are they doing what they said they were going to do, right? Like, let's say this GPU committed to delivering 4K resolution, 100 millisecond ping uh, with 99.9% uptime. Well, how do we know that? The only way we can enforce that in a decentralized and trustless manner is by empowering these checkers to hundreds of times a minute, be checking all the different Mm -hmm. container GPUs and making sure that like, okay, we verified it's up. Oh, we verified it's this resolution. And once they form a consensus, then we're like, okay, we can issue a reward to this container for the service it's providing, right? And that's why the checkers are absolutely integral to our ecosystem because they perform this very important function of just validating the fact that work was done and SLAs are being met. Now, the... Uh, checker nodes are essentially just licenses that we sold mm-hmm. that people can purchase in order to download a software, run on the computer. Uh, they literally just click run or you can delegate to a node operator to service for them. And then that's it. You earn tokens just for running this. As long as you have a pretty good and stable internet connection, you're golden. Mm-hmm. Now, the containers, we knew that it's it's a little bit higher barrier of entry. Not everyone has... $300,000 to buy an H100 from NVIDIA, yeah. right? Or like a T3 or T4 data center connection. Um, so that market we knew is going to be a little bit higher barrier entry, which is why we lowered the barrier so much for the checkers so that anyone could participate. If the container side might be a little centralized because there's only like 100 or 200 NCP partners that can source NVIDIA H100s, mm-hmm. then balance that out by really decentralizing the checker role. Now, this is the three piece of the puzzle. You have the containers with the engine, the GPU compute. Mm -hmm. You have the checkers, inspectors of the ecosystem. And then you have the protocol doing the indexing, which is the matchmaking of the actual demand to the compute services. And that's kind of our secret sauce of how do we matchmake the right need for service with the closest point of service that also matches the SLA requirements of this demand. And that's kind of the function that we do as the indexer. And hence there is a 5% fee for the uh, containers. The rewards that they receive, we take a 5% fee for that for routing them work. Gotcha. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. So now, so, so the containers, essentially the GPUs, we just say containers, GPUs, obviously not everybody can, 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 uh, pitch in 300,000 to actually make these, yeah. these H100s. Gotcha. So I guess that'd be, that'd be the next one. 
because you guys put out, this was an executive summary, and you talked about the GPU that you actually have will, will be the, the containers. Now, things have actually updated, I'm sure. This was uh, put out maybe yeah. a month ago or so, and, or so. and one month in, in the crypto world is an eternity. But you're taking a look at the number of GPUs you guys have, 40,562, Akash 150, Render 43, and io.net 198. Of course, I'm sure they've changed a little bit. But if we go and take a look at this underneath here, you you mentioned the number of A100s and H100s, which are the big the big guns of, of NVIDIA. And it looks like on this section, you have 4,000. So out of the 40,000, what about this 36,000 other GPUs? Would this be like smaller ones, like Snapdragons, or what are we looking at here? Yeah, great question. So uh, our service is aimed for real-time latency-sensitive use cases, right? Like AI inferencing, cloud gaming. We also do a AI LLM training. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what a lot of the H100s are for. But a big part of the market is for all the smartphone virtualization we do. Um, the cloud gaming, cloud rendering, pixel streaming instances that we do. And so those are ARM GPUs, right? Uh, meant, meant for ARM experiences, right? And so these are, they're not your $300,000 right. H100s, but they're enterprise grade GPUs and usually system on chips because, well, to, to render a game, it's not just a GPU. You need storage, you need memory, you need caching, et cetera. And so it's actually an entire almost like mini server or what we call SOC, system on chip, rather than just a GPU, because a GPU is not enough. So in that, we quote the number of GPUs, but it's like, a lot of people are like, oh, GPUs is the engine. Okay, cool. I could say we have X amount of Hemi V8s. Yeah. Or I could say like, actually, I have 30 some thousand Dodge Challengers, because it takes a whole car to run, not just the engine. And so that's kind of the distinction that we have. and. Um, that's where like, we, yes, we have lots of powerhouse H100s, mm -hmm. but for the real time cloud gaming scenarios, uh, the visualization scenarios, we have entire system on chips and entire, uh, server spec built out specifically for those use cases. Gotcha. That makes more sense. So we take a look at 40,000. We're like, that's amazing. That must be all these chips. But of course it's uh, different strokes for different folks and they need different things to actually make things run. Gotcha. So this sounds great. Dan, all this sounds great. Everything that we did in the deep dive sounds fantastic, but let's let's bring it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not everything makes it. There's roadblocks to be had. So when you and the other co-founders got together, <clears throat> what have you thought about as far as like what could be the stumbling blocks and uh, the things that could really push back Aether moving forward? And that could be, you could talk about a month, the six months or one or two years because every business is different. So what could yeah. be like, we talked a lot about the pros. Let's talk about the cons a little bit. Yeah, that's um, honestly, that's that's what kind of keeps us up at night. And that's why our our platform generally tends to be more demand driven. Um, what I mean by this is what we didn't want was to create a giant freeway with no cars on it. Right. Right. Like that's that's great. And unfortunately, in Web3, there's a lot of these massive ecosystems at ungodly amounts of valuation, multiple billions or way more than that. But there's what, like 50 users, 100 right. users, right? And there's no monetization. We went at this the other way. How do we find real users, real demand, real use case? And then how do we onboard them by lowering the barrier of entries through a lower service fee such that they're able to spin up uh, new experiences, new demands, new services to actually drive retail adoption? And so that's what we're focused on. That's what we've been optimizing for. But that's also what we're most worried about is because that adoption cycle takes a while, right? Um, what we yeah. don't want is for a huge lag in this adoption. If we can't get, if we let the chicken and the egg like thing get out of balance, too much compute comes on board, but not enough ba uh, demand, then all you have is an ecosystem where there's a ton of resources, but super underutilized. And then everyone is just farming what I mentioned earlier, magic internet money without actually any real use case, any real impact that actually drives adoption. And so that's what we're concerned about. Hence, we actually, we actually, I think we're the only ones in the industry to do this. We gate who can onboard, right? Like mm -hmm. most, and this is where it's kind of like we, to meet these SLAs and to ensure that there's the right amount of supply and demand matching. It's not like you can just, cool, you meet these specs, you can 
uh, download something and just onboard your compute. No, we actually only allow as much compute to onboard to ensure there's a healthy balance with the demand that's been able to, we've been able to secure and onboard in the ecosystem. That way, utilization rates are extremely high and the inflationary measures in our ecosystem are not out of control. Gotcha. Excellent response. And I guess it, it keeps us all up at night, right? We have a great product. We have a great fit. We have a great match. But then what happens? Where's the demand? So, yeah. So, Dan, Mr. Wang, we will uh, we will leave it at that. I want to say, again, thanks for coming on. And we'll have you back when there's some updates to, to be talked about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So just like Dan said, it really comes down to they are a demand-driven business. This is the dashboard at Aether.com, the link in the description. You can see the resource map and what is being used right now. So the service fee received, it's not that much, honestly, 1.8 million. I mean, it's enough for like a single person, but I mean, for a corporation, it's not that much. Total containers, 124,000. Total GPUs, 42,000, which is an increase from uh, the original number because time moves very fast. Here's the resource map as far as like the global and who is using these AI resources. Here's the GPUs online and of course the session. So we know there are things happening, but again, the nodes I think are a long-term play. The token itself is for right now. And that's what we have. It really comes down to the pros and cons. And this is how I see the pros right now. First of all, for Aether, the narrative and the timing for DPIN and AI is perfect. We're coming into the Bitcoin happening, and I can tell right now that uh, there is a mania for DPIN and AI, and that's why I think this token will do very well. And uh, number two, it has an actual working product, which is quite rare, quite honestly, in uh, in in this uh, sector as far as crypto and digital assets. So it's actually being used right now. We just took a look at it a little bit ago. So that's to me, a step in the right direction. Also, it's one of the first in this sector, so they have first mover advantage. Obviously, there are other ones. We talked about them right here. And it's not like it's a one-person take-all or one project take-all. There is a room enough for all this compute, and it's scarce. And then number five, the partnerships. And the buzz for liftoff is there, so I'm feeling pretty bullish about this project. But if we're going to talk about the pros, let's talk about the cons. And Dan Wang said it itself. He goes, look, we are demand-driven. We did not want to build a highway with no cars, and we'll see how this takes off. I think there's enough demand for a compute, but the question is, will this all flow to Aether, or how much will actually go to it? And of course, it all comes down to execution and partnerships. Look, a lot of businesses start up great, and they can fail. There was a story just a little bit ago about how Apple just quit the EV or electric vehicle race because after 10 years, they just couldn't break into it. So just because something looks good doesn't mean it's gonna actually make it. And of course, the last piece will, of course, is early equals massive risk. And just so everybody knows, I will be investing into this project. I think it's gonna do quite well, but it's all up in the air. And that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. But that's it for this piece. Thanks so much for stopping by, I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.